Can you can you hear me? No. How about that? Better. All right. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for having me. I'd like to thank Easton foremost for contacting me, arranging this. And I'd like to thank Claudia so much and everyone here at Coastal Carolina. It's, it's a delight to be here. And what I'll do today is I'm really talking about art a bit, ethics a bit, nature, but really at the heart of it, the foremost of what I'm addressing and what I want you to address is, is relationships with nature. What is nature? Who are we? Why are we here? Right? And so one of the things I love is Andy Goldsworthy, who's rather the poster boy for environmental art, eco art, is that he says, we need the earth, does the earth need us? So a lot of the first things I want you to think about is, A, what is your current relationship with nature? And then I want you to think about what would you like for your relationship to nature to be? Where would you like for it to be? So just for a moment, think about what is it? What's your relationship? What do you want it to be? And I think a lot of the heart of this goes into it is to what is, what is actually nature? Right. Um, so I'll start off the, the presentation, and it looks like it'll be a descriptive one for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe, and a lot of this is really nice because this is a, a bit of an awkward presentation for the PowerPoint, it's hard to see. But when talking about nature, our relationship with nature, this is really a, a, a fine example of it, right? So we're here in the elements, it's not exactly cooperating with how we want it to be, so we need to loosen, let go of a bit of control, roll with it, that's right? So that's why, why we're here. Um, my background. I guess it was a bit intimidating giving a lecture for the Ethics Center because I'm, I'm not an ethics professor. Right? It's not my specialty, it's not my field. Um, but I do love the concepts of it. So I'll start the presentation with showing some of my own work and how I got into this idea, interest of ethics with, with the environment. I've always loved nature since I was a very small boy. I've always loved art. Right? So nature and art came right together for me. Right. Something that was interesting for me is I used to use nature, and as I'll show in the PowerPoint, to inform my artwork. I think a lot of a classic way of, of I have a lot of students who say, oh, I'm into nature, I love nature, and they want to make artwork, and the first thing that we do is we look at landscapes, right? representations of nature. So that's nature informing the artwork. I used to try to do that, and then now i found that it's, to me, a, a much greater strength to actually let art inform me about nature. So a lot of what I'm talking about is using the creative process of making artwork in nature, about nature. And then th through that, there's self-awareness. I learn more about nature. I pay more attention to it. And this is all through the creative process of making art. Another thing I always teach my students and have them read are a lot of very early um, Native American writings, saying that there is no word for art, right? And I know going to graduate school, we learned to make our portfolios, put our name on cards, get it out, promote, promote, promote. And I love the idea that that's, that's, not, that's nonsense, that that's full of ego. Right? So one of the first things I teach my students is that art is not about making an object. And so if you look traditionally how art started, and I'll show a few examples, or I'll describe a few examples, it was really a search for enlightenment, spiritual enlightenment. There's not a word for art. There was not an object. Um, when Native American tribes would make sand, sand drawings, um, carve into the rocks, all of it was because it was believed the divine energy was in those materials. They were meditating through the creative process. Then it was all brushed away. It was gone at the end. It's not about object making or, or putting a name, your big name out there. Right. So that's a little bit of what I'm about those relationships. So how I, I got into it, there's a beautiful slide up here for you. <laughs> and again, always wanting to. Um, I bounced in my life between nature and art. And while I was studying art, I actually I worked in a tropical orchid nursery. Uh, this is what I did for a living after undergrad. So what you're seeing here is actually my daily environment when I worked in the orchid nursery. Um, I grew about 25,000 orchids, and I was very entranced. They're the most complex of flowers. They're the most advanced flowers. So I was very mystified. So of course, as an artist, I immediately want to, to you know, bring that experience of being in my greenhouse to you, the viewer. So you can see the orchids there, lovely. <laughs> As a ceramicist, I became especially uh, attentive to some orchids which are called lady slippers. 
right? And if you look at these, these are complex three-dimensional forms that look like pots, right? It's fine, we'll roll with it. <laughs> so I tried to make all these orchids, and there's some really nice artwork I made up there. <laughs> but I learned quickly that you, you cannot beat the orchid, right? So I started looking at these orchids, they're complex forms, they're three-dimensional forms, they're vessels, all things that are intriguing to the artist. And so I tried to reproduce that. And I learned you cannot beat the orchid. So if you look at how orchids, as an example of nature, normally depicted, this is an old botanical drawing. Right? So if you really look at how nature comes to art, the first thing was botanical study, botanical study. And these are some, some porcelain pieces I did imitating orchids. You probably cannot see, can you? <laughs> Right, so one thing I found working this way is still forcing things about the orchid into clay. You can't beat the orchid, it couldn't give that experience. So then I learned it's much better right, to, to actually, instead of letting nature inform the artwork, you know, use the creative process to inform the work. So I stopped messing with orchids. I said, That's, it's already done, it's, it's perfect, I can't do that, there's no need for me to mess with orchids. So I started working in Wisconsin at a workshop and we totally worked outdoors, right? So in this setting, as you imagine, it's frustrating enough to have a presentation out here, right? But if this becomes your studio, instead of worrying about, you know, the projector falling over, things falling over, you learn to work with it, right? So working with clay, as you're working, if it's very bright, if it's very sunny out, your clay dries out halfway, right? So you're, you're just with that. Or you could be in the middle of the, the most strongest piece you've ever made, and it starts to rain. Right? So the piece dissolves and it washes back to the ground. So it's a very defining moment for me and kind of how I got interested in this idea of eco-art, environmental art, process versus object making. Also what I do too is, uh, is learn to wood fire, which in ceramics is it's a pretty hot fad now, but it's when you actually use the wood as fuel to fire the work, to bring the work to maturity. So I love that idea then of, of digging clay in a particular area using the lumber, the fallen trees, which have fallen on their own, recycling that as fuel. When you burn those trees at high temperature, it leaves a pallet on the pots. So for me, that was taking the wisdom of the trees and informing the work. It's a bit more mature. And what you can see here is when you're working outside, things start interacting. So there's a slide up here, there's a large piece. And when I come back, there would be slugs covered all over it. Right, and so then the next thing I start to see, I start building slugs on the tree. Right, if you notice when we're in a studio, we have a flat table we work on, everything has a flat base. So it was really nice to just take clay and start putting it right up on the tree, start working, making clays, making slugs, made a whole village of slugs. There's one that's here in the gallery. So for me, that process, that loosening up, letting go of control, really I think can speak to our relationship to the environment. If we let go of control, if we let go of our comforts, there's a letting go of the ego, and I believe a heightens spiritual enlightenment. So what you see here is, is when I went back to Clemson, we did lots, which is where I got my master's, did lots of wood firing, I was really into that, still making lots and lots of objects. Um, one thing I love about that is it's very process oriented. Right? So if you were in nature, why not use nature? Why not use materials from nature? So by using the wood that's fallen on the spot where I made the piece, it became very informed and then I start firing with that wood, it's a very abusive. One thing that started happening is I started losing control of the work. Right? When you're firing for three to five days, 2,300 degrees, you're tired, you're throwing, you know, you sling seven, eight cords of wood into the kiln, a chunk of wood goes right into a pot, right? It cracks pieces. The high heat warps pieces. Here in the West, we like a nice controlled, smooth clay. We want something we can put our utilitarian function to. Right? We want something to put our toothbrush in, our coffee in. So I love the fact that these pieces are being torn. They're taking away utilitarian function. And I started to appreciate that aesthetic. It's also a lot of work. Um, it's very labor intensive. So the fact that you have to hand split seven to eight cords of wood, um, which would probably cover this whole area of, of where folks are gathered, you learn the trees, you learn the wood. When you split each piece of wood, you see the grubs come out. You see them later in the seasons turn into to, um, 
beetles and so forth, right? She'd pay attention to the grain of the wood, the different barks. So that's where I became very interested in actually being in tune with the nature of materials, letting that become the work. So I actually now decided to make all the work outside. I actually would make work in the kilns, setting up these things to happen, setting up for bugs to interact, setting up for trees to fall into the pieces for them to crash, and then firing away. And as you can see, there's a lot of heat. Again, interacting with nature, I love the idea that you're trying to harness 300 cubic feet of a fire that's 2,300 degrees. Right? So again, you have to let go of control. It's understanding the fire. Right? So you're setting it up, and then you give it all over. So again, these are just quick parallels to our relationship with nature. So there's lots of fire, lots of fire. <laughs> Right, and the work develops from that. So where I started with going from that is how can I take this further? I'm still making objects, right? You know, I teach, I have to have exhibitions, so forth. None of this which really has to do with my relationship to the environment. That's here in man's world. We've got to meet these deadlines, pass things, success, right? So following through with this, I began to become very interested in not making as much of a product-oriented piece, letting go of that control. So instead of making my own clay, I decided to go out and venture out and find clay, which is what I'm doing now and needing to have an exhibition, needing to make objects, they are they're in there. But what I do that I love now is I'll actually take clay, dig it, work on site in a day like today, if it's raining, if it's hot, it's dry, if it's cold, working with that material, making a piece intuitively, right then and there, leaving it in the woods so that you all would never see it. I might never return to see it. So then, of course, you start telling folks this, they, that's hard to bite, right? Well, what about documentation? What about all these ideas, right? How are you going to show anybody you've been doing anything? All you're doing is out there in the woods playing, right? Well, and as you're exactly right. That's exactly what I'm doing, <laughs> right? So the idea of permanence comes up and it's something I want you to think about. So. But you dig the clays, if you notice the work is in, that's inside, when I make an object, the work intuitively, it allows that information from around me to become involved. Right? I don't go out there and set to make a certain form. So working like this, just like we're talking now, if the wind's blowing like this, if the sun's setting that way, the work is going to pick that up, and I'll make a form that's new to me, and I'll learn more about myself. So one thing I like doing with that is leaving the piece out there. It decomposes. So if we talk about our relationship to nature, the next great set of slides I had for you, we're going back and documenting how man's relationship with nature has been in the art world. Right. If you look at a lot of how it begins, really our first work is about spiritual enlightenment. Um, I had some slides up, slides, slides up of the Nazca lines, which are in Peru. Right. These are four meter deep by 12 meter um, wide lines that form anthropomorphic creatures, spiders, ants, geometric designs that can only be seen by satellite in space. And this was done thousands and thousands of years ago. So why are we making this art if no one's going to see it? Who was to see that kind of work? All right? So again, if we can let go of the, the ego, we let go of that object, learn about ourselves. Right? So the spiritual enlightenment through that. This is back in the day. right? So then we become, we start to understand ourselves more, then we become fearful of nature, right? It becomes destructive, and then we become uncomfortable, right? So then we, you can see a lot of our, our artworks in the beginning of time, Stonehenge and the megalithic age, trying to figure out these patterns, right? What's going on with the solar system? How do things work? So then we become a bit more in harmony with it. If you start looking at things like the snake mound, right? Shaping the earth, but it's in a nice sense of harmony. We're not dominating it. And we're not letting the earth, nature, dominate us. So then to go th quickly through time, many, many thousands of years, up to the Romantic period, again here we become fond of nature again. We always have this return to nature, which is constant. And everyone's running out in the woods, and they're you know, making work and, and getting involved with it. And then Impressionism takes certain the study of light. And then all of a sudden we hit the 1960s, 1970s, and we have BAM environmental art, ecological art. Everything takes over. So I think a lot of these parallel what we see with environmental ethics, which really defines our relationship to nature. 
if you look at um, environmental ethics, a lot of ideas of anthropocentrism, right? Where we are here in the middle, it's for our human need. If I can burn that tree, use it to fuel my house, keep me warm, is that right? Right? It's, it's, my, it's my duty as a human, right? I'm the center. And we also have, we talk about the Buddha nature of things, right? Where each piece has a divine spirit within each natural being, right? So that can set us up as how do we relate to that, right? If this is a divine tree, how do we use it? How do we set up our sensibilities for that? Also have the approach in environmental ethics of nonviolence, which to a, a degree could be taken as non-interaction. Some people kind of can say that's Buddhist and Buddhist, I think they disagree. By just sitting back and not doing anything, that's, that's not as productive. And we also talk about the ideas too of deep ecology, which is really where I'm going at with my artwork and what I was hoping you could see with the slides. Using, and what I do with that is use the creative process for self-awareness. And if you look at a lot of deep ecology, it's talking about self-awareness, seeing how you're integrated with nature, and a more of a balance of respect that yes, you respect the tree, you respect the divineness of it, but it can also fell it, use it to warm you if it's needed. A lot of this also falls too with ethical holism, where it's all for the greater of the whole good. Right? So if you look at a lot of the artwork that which I had prepared for you, <laughs> you would see that a lot of these artworks address those issues. Right? Is is we have one sick deer that could hurt the whole crop, is that deer removed or do you let the whole herd of deer suffer? So a lot of artists are addressing these issues now. Right? So a lot of what I'm interested in is how that creative process unravels these answers for you. Right? Um, so a lot of artwork now, right? if you look at modernism, it's all about you, the artist, the master, being off in your cave of the studio, having all this divine connection, divine inspiration, making these fantastic objects, and then presenting them to the public, to the people. So what's changed with that now and what could be called a more feminine approach because it's of its warmth, encouragement of it, is that instead of being separate, a lot of artists now are working in groups and it's not about putting a name on an object. They're actually working in nature, making things that are ephemeral, right? The idea of not making that finalized that object with your name on it. So if we look at that progression in the 60s, 70s, we think we have all this environmental art. A lot of it's just rebellion, right? A lot of it's just staying and keeping its anti-gallery it's anti-commodity, it's still pretty macho, it's still pretty, I'm gonna go out in the desert and buy a crater and make it my gallery, right? So if we look at Smithson, um, if we look at um, Heiser, right, a lot of these guys, big egos, using that, that nature as a gallery. The work, yes, it ties in nature, it's in nature, but it's not driven by nature. So then you get come along some folks, my favorite folks like Richard Long, Amish Fulton, who aren't taking quite is an aggressive approach to land. They're not shaping it for their own reasons, right? But the, the idea of walking being a sculpture, right? That you yourself or the utensil will walk back and forth on this lawn. You're gonna make a line. You're gonna make an impression. So the fact that Richard Long is out there documenting his walks, making lines with rocks, bringing out attention to nature in a way that's not harmful to nature. It's ephemeral, it's, it's, um, it's not gonna be there. All right? Amish Fulton doesn't even uh, do, any, do anything with nature itself. He's walking, right, observing, documenting, and then the whole idea of art is to communicate. So if he's bringing that experience to you, what Amish does is actually just, with a topography, if you walk into a gallery, it's, it'll show the date, it'll show the time where he was, how many miles, and that's it, right? And so that's kind of progressed, and then we have people like Andy Goldsworthy, Nils Udo, right, who find their way to the coffee, to the coffee table in your house with big, beautiful pictures of nature. Right? Talking about the ephemerality of nature and the beauty of it. Um, and that's nice, but does that ethically, is that going to make you change how you affect nature, your relationship with nature? Is that going to bring social calls to our environmental issues, to global warming, right? Do we clear cut an area to put a Walmart, right? Does that art have a change for that? So I think one thing that's very interesting, and maybe if it gets darker, we could see a lot of the slides. There are a lot of artists now who are really making their work for change. Um, some examples I had are of an artist, one, if we're to understand the rights of animals, if that's an interest of yours, right? The, how do we treat the environment? Um, if we don't think they have any thinking capacity, moral capacity, how do you affect that, right? And so one interesting thing artists are doing now are actually putting video cameras on animals, 
watching that interaction, putting you in the place of the animal, bringing that experience to you. Other artists now are using environmental ethics, environmental issues to challenge their work to go beyond the object and actually having social change. So I had an image of an artist who made it beautiful, formally, you know, three-dimensional sculptural water fountains, but as the water runs through, it's actually filtering the water where there's poor water. Right? Other artists now are using oyster mushrooms, placing them in forms, and then it actually cleans the soil where there are PCBs, toxic, toxic chemicals in the soil. So artists now are becoming blurred with activists, with environmentalists, and of course that's where art is now today anyway. There's no, there's no boundaries, it's all interdisciplinary. So I'm curious as, as your thoughts on that as, as art. Right? There's other artists who walk around placing rocks in circles, making zeros. Right? If we look at one thing that's interesting, if we look at a lot of environmental art from day one to right now, consistent forms, consistent shapes are spirals and circles. One of those artists has called onto that, catching the zero and pushing for zero impact in the world environmentally. Zero population growth, zero trash, zero impact. So I think that's where it's pretty interesting now where environmental art is, is actually using the art to function, using it utilitarian-wise to make a change on the environment. All right. So my question for you today, and of course it's hard to see without slides and so forth, is going back to that relationship with nature. All right. What is nature to you? What is your relationship? And what are you going to do about it? For me, a lot of this artwork, a lot of this thinking points to a spiritual disconnect. Right? And I think if you look at where our society is today, I think it'd be an easy conclusion to say there is a spiritual disconnect. So my, my question, my push through my art and presenting others' art is that by paying attention to the small details of nature, I, I doubt very many people could tell the species of these trees in here, the type of grass, et cetera. But if we really tune into nature, I think there's a lot of enlightenment to be had. It will affect our ethical sensibilities. It will affect our decisions during the day. And I think make us stronger connected spiritually, which I would think would make for a better life, better sense of ethics. So I'm curious if, A, do you think art has the power to do this? Does art do this? And today, when you leave, as I see on many campuses, everyone's plugged in. We walk away from here, we plug right back in on your phone, we go right back, right back to your email, and we actually have a different stance, a different change or awareness for the environment. All right, so I think that's the question to walk away to discuss is what can bring that change? Is it important to be aware of the environment? All right, that's what we as artists, that's what the art that I brought for you to see today that's all trying to do is to show you that awareness, make you stop, be aware. So does that do anything? Is it art? What will you do when you walk away from here today? All right, so I'd love to have discussion, questions. Again, I apologize, there's not much of a PowerPoint slide for you. Um, so interesting comments and theories. Uh, I guess my personal art is an escape from that. <laughs> um, and life's so chaotic now, it's hard, hard to do. Um, with young children, full-time faculty job, et cetera, it's hard to get in the woods. So for me, it's, it's an escape, um, but it's a representative, too, that the fact that I need that, that I yearn to be in the woods. I think that's what society forces that. I'm, I'm anti-technology. <laughs> I don't enjoy using computers. I always break them, I mess them up. This is a perfect example of how things work for me, t technology. So for me, it fits just right. Um, but I would say, as far as how society going, I can see two schools, some fully embracing technology. There's a lot of wonderful things. Some fully embracing that. Um, I think also there's gonna be a return more to nature, more of a return to formal objects. I'm also with that, that school of thought. Um, I was just reading the paper, I think it's interesting. So it reflect society, I think we are getting there. I, know, I heard, read recently that more 
than ever, folks who are under 40 are pursuing degrees in farming. I also raise chickens. I don't raise the as much. I raise lots of chickens now. It's a very popular thing. So why, why when I drive into the city to go teach, should I see chickens running across the road, right? So I think there's a need within society to connect. And I think that's what I'm responding with. I think people are going to go two ways with it. Other questions or discussion? Yes. I think there's a good twofold approach to that. Um, I think there's an implicit and explicit way of doing it. Um, some of it, I know with my personal work, is that I know you're not going to go out to nature. Not you personally, but as the viewer. So some of the forms I made are very simple. Right? They're just the raw clay that was there. There's no glaze, there's no firing, or very light firing. And then I brought the actual objects of nature that were there growing from the clay I dug. So that's one way that the art can inform the nature's there. And I think one thing that I might have skipped is that by going into nature and making art, that's what I was implying, that that's when we learn more about nature, using that creative process. So one of the artists I had to talk about was um, Patrick Doherty. He uses something we're all familiar with, with twigs. Right? So if you're in nature and you actually pick up twigs, start building with them, you're actually going to start paying more attention to the twig itself as opposed to just walking by it. So I think what I meant by learning more about nature is actually using the creative process in nature with natural materials, I think can bring a person more in tune at that spot. If we're all here and we all as a collective start making an installation using each blade of grass here, I think by the end of it we all know a lot more about that, this grass than, before, than we do now. So that's kind of where I was going with it. wondering whether uh, the greatest benefit of connectivity with nature that we can gain is that is that gained do you think through like making the art or uh, viewers that come into for instance nature where art nature has been made like in comparison what kind of experience or benefit do you want them as an artist to have gained and like how are those two different you know what I mean like the viewer versus the artist yeah, I think f for the viewer, um, well, I'm not sure art can ever really quite get the viewer. And so are you, are you asking about the viewer or the artist? Well, it sounds like you, you really developed a person through your experience of right. making art. And oh. through, as you said, this process-oriented... Uh, are you kind of asking, too, if I expect other people to do that, or are they going to get... I, I, I think so, personally. Like, what role do I, as somebody who's not making nature art, like, how can I sort of experience this deeper connectivity through nature art if I'm not making it as canon? Yeah, no, I think that's a great, a great question. It gets to the heart of the issue, the heart of the idea of ethics, too. And with art in general, can art do anything? Can art bring about change? I think what we try to do as artists is to bring that experience, which was self-revealing to me, self-transforming to me, to bring that experience to you through the work. Um, that's our goal. Will it happen? Is it as powerful as, as my experience or the, whichever artist experience? I doubt it. But I think what we're trying to do is to bring that awareness to you. But that's, that's a hard thing. Right? So that's why I mean, will you actually, if somebody sees my work, will they actually pay more attention to nature? It's my intent, it's my hope. Um, certainly wouldn't guarantee it. You know?
And I think, too, one of the great things about <laughs> I heard you. <laughs> uh, well, I think one thing she mentions of one of the important things of, of Dari's work is that he's using something we're all familiar with, right? With the twigs, the sticks, we've all played with them, bringing them to a beautiful form. And I think I'm thinking with the fact that you can interact with the work, right? That you, the viewer, can then work, walk through the piece and get more of a sense of appreciation with it. I think another important thing to tack on with that is location. Um, I think when, when talking with him, uh, who lives not far from me, if we made a piece where everyone on campus is walking through, then they, they experience nature, right? So for me, my work is out in nature. When I brought it in here, you're seeing the clay that I dug from the swamp Tuesday morning that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. So I think location has a, a bit to do with it as well. I'm not sure. I don't think I fully t responded to what you said. Yeah. Oh, how do I feel about making a living? Do you ever sell your art? I do, and I think, I think the first lesson is life's a paradox. And, that, <laughs> and once you figure that out, you're good to go. <laughs> um, I think it's, again, it's a balance. Um, and I, the majority of my living is from teaching, so I enjoy that. I also enjoy selling work, because I, I think it's nice for someone to have that, that someone else can appreciate that and what that brings to their lives. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of paradoxes and ironies to it. Um, but also right now I'm not living just for myself. I have a, a wife and two children that I provide for. So yeah, there's the balance. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's lots of ideal things I wish that were that way, but it's, it's all a game. Yeah, she asked, do I ever, ever use recycled materials such as scraps, recycles? Is that correct, or do I just use? I, I don't personally respond to working that way. Um, I have a lot of students that I teach, um, some sustainability sculpture classes. It's the first thing they want to go for is using, they'll go and we collect all the recycled materials on campus and use that. Uh, for me, it's a bit, it's a bit literal. Um, with that idea of, of recycling and everything going green now, sustainability. And again, I guess for me that's so human influenced. And there's something I love about when I reached my hand two feet underwater, pulled up that clay, that's, that's what gets it for me. Other questions? I'm kind of curious too, what, what, do you, what nature is for you? Or, if, or are you happy with your relationship? Sounds like I'm in the counseling now, but right. <laughs> are you, do you feel aware? Do you feel in tune with nature? Would you like to be more in tune? Do you not care? Which is fair. And well, for me personally, nature is it's the physical, the visual, it's a total sensual representation of a higher power. Uh, for me, it's a guide, right? I study the woods a lot. I'm in the woods all the time, studying animals. They're never, they're never wrong, right? So I love that fact that it's a constant source I can look to as a guide. Um, I have friends, family who have a lot of stress. I think it's interesting when they're in nature, all that goes away. Um, there seems to be instant clarity. And then we step back into the car, back into the lives, it's, it's all chaos again. So there's got to be something about it that's, that's there, um, that's beyond us. Mm -hmm. Years ago, I was at the uh, Arboretum at 
Princeton University. I was walking through the woods with a bunch of scientists. As we're walking through the woods, we look down the woods, and here was these funky little forms down on the ground that looked like some kind of rocks or whatever. And all the scientists, of course, proceeded to give their theories as to what these were. These were remnant rocks. These were some animal that built a mound, and all kinds of strange theories. And, and then, of course, we all put our theory. We walked on all of them scientific interpretations. And as we walked away, there's some guy bringing up the back, and he goes, no, those are uh, somebody put some artistic things out there. And <laughs> so that just goes to show you that depending on who sees these, they might see it as nature several years later, and uh, they may be really wrong. And, and the wonderful thing now is that they're probably not there now. So it's, it's a wonderful resource we all have are the sculpture gardens. They're yeah, pretty, pretty hot. It's one of the best ones in the southeast, featuring a lot of these artists. And I know when I was at school there, a lot of those works aren't there now, and works are there before or not. So other things to think about, that idea of what's ephemeral permanence, um, things to think about. I just always ask my students, I'm like, can you let go of this? Right? I teach clay, so stuff breaks and blows up all the time. And I see the tears, right? the expectations. Um, so I try to tell them that's really the, the small faction of it. So how, how attached are we to things? Right, it all goes back to our comforts. Right? So if, if you know where you are in the world, right, you're never lost. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do, I do a lot of that. Um, I can try to, again, I'm just kind of at a loss here. <laughs> Uh, but there's some images, actually about 20 of them, that uh, for me that's the strongest way of working. Uh, that's the way I love working the most. Um, it's very liberating, it's very free, but then here I am in an academic position. I go up for tenure, I've got to show them the band, this exhibition, that exhibition, da 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 da. So yeah, that's where it's the paradox, that's where it's the irony. Um, I actually started when I was an undergrad making things in the studio, and I, I went to school at Brevard College, which was in the National Forest. I'd actually start making all these objects, and as I was hiking along, I made these little kind of fancy puddle jumper creatures. And I started making them and actually sticking them all on the trails in the National Forest. Right? So for me, that's kind of my favorite gallery. Um, I have a good image up here working on a lake, building this large form out in the middle of the lake. While I'm working, people come by, they interact, they talk. Um, there's kayakers in the last picture. So for me, that's, that's the ultimate gallery. Um, and again, I guess it could be self-serving, but a lot of it, I don't, I don't care if you see it or not. It is, it is for me, it's that creative process, it's that forgetting in touch. But they say in the art world, we don't make things for ourselves, right? No, I'd, I'd say the art's complete for me when, it, when I'm done with it. Yeah, when I'm finished making it. Hmm? Because you've seen it. Right. Mm -hmm. No, that's, I'd say that's the minute I lose attachment. Pardon? That's the minute that I lose attachment to the piece. It's once, I guess it is, it's a selfish thing, but once I've gotten my internal needs met or I'm feeling in tune, enlightened, that's, that's what I'm searching for. It's not the object itself. That's just a physical representation of my experience. Um, but it's fine with me if it cracks right that minute and falls away. It's fine if it lasts 10,000 years. Yeah. And that takes the stress out of driving around with lots of ceramics, too. <laughs> what do you think about the difference between the act of, um, like, me knowing what the name of this type of grass is so that I can understand it better in an academic sense versus me manipulating the grass in an artistic way so that I can understand it more intuitively? But I may never know anything more about it, how it grows in the summer because I'm here in the spring. Well, I think the second part that you talked about is the stronger the strength of the learning. Um, I think names, all that, that's all man-made, that's all for us. Um, but I think it's the understanding of, of the material, how that blade flexes, and that's where the creative process comes in. That's when you have to learn it. It's going to move. How does it stick to the next piece of grass? That, for me, is much more important than knowing it's, it's Latin genus and species. Mm -hmm. um, and what I meant by that, too, is I think there's a knowledge, whether we know the names, scientific names or not, 
um, I think if we look back to how our relationship with nature was, is that we did know what kind of use we could get from grass. We knew what kind of use we could get from the tree, what's, what's tonics, you know, materials, usage. That's why I think it's disconnected now. We don't even pay attention to the birds, so forth, the animals. I take my students out a lot, and I ask them to, um, to write down what they observe. Then I ask them to make a piece of artwork on site using those materials. I give them about 30 minutes, an hour to do that. Then I ask them to go back and write down what they observe. The first set that they write, writing what they observe is about a page. When they go back out again and write what they observe, it's about four to five pages. So, any other questions? Or? I know personally how it affects my actions um, because a lot of it, and that's why I was talking a bit more about deep ecology, self-awareness and also a sense of respect. So if through working this way, through becoming harmonious, quote harmonious with nature, which is very fleeting, <laughs> then I think we get a greater sense of respect and if I'm walking, you know, I might not treat that piece the same way. Um, I think it'd be easy to throw trash down, right, but hopefully if I'm in that area, gain that insight, that respect, I would hopefully not put the trash down. Um, but again, I think it's a, it's a big paradox. Some of the, the greatest woodsmen I know, the people who know the woods better than anything, um, chain pack, you know, chain smoke four packs of cigarettes a day. And <laughs> so I think, yeah, there's a lot of irony there. Um, but for me personally, it definitely affects my action because I'm more aware. So I think that's the hope of it is that by communing awareness, hopefully awareness would lead to a change of action. Any other questions or thoughts? And again, I thank, I thank you for being appreciative, working with me with the, with the nice screen up there and, and off the cuff. <laughs>
and that's fine. <coughs> but I have to say, there's been a lot of years of, of throwing to get get to that point. I may or may not make sense to you. Because I will say, a clay like this is very, at this stage, is very, very sensitive. Right? It's going to be very responsive. So how I shape my hands to the amount of pressure. Um, I can't overwork it, it'll fall apart. Does your ring affect it anything? Um, I don't notice it does. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I mean... Catching it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's probably wearing down the surface. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like my hand's growing around. Um, I know my students, if I have long fingernails, that can mess with it. See, it's already starting to get a little, a little off. So even wall thickness isn't really a concern for you? I wouldn't want to go from four inches to a quarter inch. But sure, if it's a, a half inch somewhere and a quarter inch somewhere, that's no big deal. How does this compare to throwing like regular porcelain? Mm, this is this is a lot trickier. Trickier. Mm -hmm. trickier. At this stage. Yeah. Now if it were drier it would be uh -huh. no sweat, it'd be a lot nicer. So when you're throwing, all you're really doing is just redistributing the clay. And I'd say it's trickier in a sense, um, compared to poison, there's not much backbone to it at all. And I think that's because it's so fresh right now. So one thing, we work, when you work a lot of this clay too, it's almost like you're trimming and alternating with throwing. Right? When you throw, like when we'll throw with that red clay, it'll be a lot more throwing, right? a lot more control. But a lot of times this, you're almost pushing in, removing the clay, as opposed to really um, pinching it together, lifting it up. So see how it's all things kind of it's nice information. Alright, so if somebody's really a kind of a quote control freak, it's probably not the best method of working. So it's already wanting to get a little, a little soft there. Do you heat gun by chance? Mm -hmm. Needle tool, maybe. Yeah. Alright, so this isn't one to play right now, so we'll go ahead and get that out of the way. So 
looks like we need to make an open form. So that's probably all we'll be able to get out of this piece at this time. Mm -hmm. while you're working with it. There's a bug right there crawling on the clay uh, while you're working with it. So the clay wanted to stop a little earlier than I was ready for it, but something kind of accept. Now that I look at it, it gave me a lot to respond to. All right, so I've had a sterile, kind of a clean bowl. I don't know where to start, but this one side wanted to fall a little bit more. So that gave me a good place to start, pushing things in, responding. That's kind of what I mean by that. So I'd say for me, at this stage, it's probably one of my favorite, favorite stages for working. Because it's already loosened me up some. I wouldn't do something like this to a bowl that I felt was, quote, perfect. Does that make sense? So that's where I think we learn, learn a bit.
Something that's kind of fun to do is taking clay that's been fired, right? cutting through the through wet clay, and then when it fires around it, it'll pull around. So this piece is getting pretty busy pretty, pretty quick. <laughs> I don't think it would be finished unless we brought a little of this in. <clears throat> so one thing I've learned a bit by doing this type of work is that it's helpful for it to be a bit busy now. Uh, there's, there's definitely probably a little too much going on, but I'm thinking too that if it's if I do submit it to heat, the majority of this will be gone. Um, one thing I enjoy doing too is if you're in nature a lot, you'll find Skeletons, skulls, and things. It's fun if you put those in the clay. Well, I think it's fun. This one, I think it's weird. But when you fire them, right, this mayor of calcium it withstands the heat of the kiln. And then if you take a piece and put it back out in nature, when it rains, the rain dissolves that, that skeletal matter and dissolves back into the earth. So a lot of times I make, make a form like this fire with the, the skeleton in it, take the piece back out into nature where I found it, leave it there. When it rains, that piece dissolves, the skeleton dissolves, and there's just a simple form there. It's almost a marker, like a grave marker for the animal. That's probably it for that. So it's kind of nice to see the process. I had no intent of making a form like this. <coughs> Sometimes you get a good little bit of energy. It'll 